In this video, we will revisit an example we saw before called the Hamming code. Recall this example that we saw in a previous video. This is an example of a code with message length k equals 4, block length n equals 7, over the alphabet 0, 1, and it was defined as follows. We have our encoding map, ENC, which takes our four message bits, x1, x2, x3, and x4, and it encodes them like this. So the message bits themselves appear as the first four bits of the code word, and then the last three bits of the code word are these linear combinations mod 2 of the various message bits. Our code C is defined as the image of the encoding map. We also saw in a previous video this nice way of looking at this code uh, using circles, where we put the message bits in the middle here, and the parity check bits showed up there. This example has a name. It's called the Hamming code, or a Hamming code. So from now on, instead of calling it example 3, I'm going to refer to it as the Hamming code of length 7. In this video, we will see two new ways of looking at the Hamming code. Here's the first one. We can view the encoding map as multiplication by a matrix mod 2. In more detail, we can write the encoding of a vector x, so think of x as the vector of length 4, x1, x2, x3, x4. This is equal to the following matrix vector product. So in this vector here, this is just going to be x, x1, x2, x3, x4. And this matrix is going to capture these linear relationships. So the first four bits are just x1, x2, x3, x4. The fifth bit is x2 plus x3 plus x4. The sixth bit is x1 plus x3 plus x4. And the seventh bit is x1 plus x2 plus x4. And everywhere I haven't drawn a 1, there should be a 0. And of course, all of this is mod 2. So if we label this matrix G, then the encoding of the vector x is just G times that vector x mod 2. The matrix G here is called a generator matrix. We'll see a formal definition in a future video. But informally, a generator matrix is just a matrix so that you can think of the encoding map as multiplication by that matrix. Now that we have this matrix vector way of looking at this encoding map, let's make a few linear algebraic observations. To make these observations, I'm going to assume that linear algebra works mod 2. We'll see what this means in a moment. But assuming that linear algebra works kind of as we expect, even though we're doing everything mod 2, here are some observations that we can make based on this uh, characterization that we just had. The first observation is that the code C is closed under addition. What that means is that for any code words C and C prime in my code C, C plus C prime is also in my code C. And to see this, we can write C plus C prime. Well, by the definition of the encoding map as multiplication by some matrix G, this is G times X plus G times X prime for some vectors X and X prime. And because this is linear, this is G times X plus X prime. And by definition, anything of this form is in C. So this is in the code C. And here, when I'm writing plus, I mean plus mod 2. A related observation is that C is a linear subspace of 0, 1 to the 7 of dimension 4. So you might remember from linear algebra class that a linear subspace is defined to be anything that is closed under linear combinations, that is, addition and scalar multiplication. We just said that this thing was closed under addition, Scalar multiplication mod 2 just means multiplication by 1, so of course it's closed under that, so this is a linear subspace, assuming that that notion makes sense mod 2. More precisely, C is the subspace which is the column span of the matrix G. 
and we can see that it has dimension 4 by looking at this matrix G. So I've just copied and pasted G over here, and we can see that the column span should have dimension 4 because these columns are all linearly independent. To see that they're linearly independent, observe that there's little identity matrix just sitting right there. Okay, so C is a linear subspace of dimension 4. These facts also imply the extremely useful fact that the distance of C, remember that's defined as the minimum Hamming distance between any pair of distinct code words in C, this distance is the same as the minimum weight of any non-zero vector in C. And remember that we defined the weight of a vector as just the number of non-zero entries. To see why this statement is true, let's observe that the distance between any two code words, C and C prime, well, this is the same as the distance between G times X and G times X prime for some appropriate X and X prime. And this is the same as the distance between gx minus gx prime and zero. That is, it's just the weight of gx minus gx prime. But again, by linearity, this is the distance between g of x minus x prime and zero. And this is the weight of g times x minus x prime but g times x minus x prime itself is a code word in C. So that means if there's any pair of code words which have some distance, there is some other code word that has as its weight that distance. So therefore the minimum distance is the same as the minimum weight of any non-zero code word. Okay, so let's just make a note of those linear algebraic observations. We'll come back to them later. And let's go back to this slide. Let's see yet another way to write the Hamming code. Let's recall this circle definition of the code. We observed in a previous video that each one of these circles constituted some sort of parity check. That is, the sum of the bits in each circle has to be 0 mod 2. Once again, that's sort of a linear relationship, mod 2, so we can write it as a matrix vector product. In this case, it would look something like this. So here I've written our potential code word there. And I'm going to fill in this three by seven matrix so that each of the three rows corresponds to the constraints given by each of these three circles. Let's start with the blue circles constraint. The blue circles constraint says that x2 plus x3 plus x4 plus c5 better sum to zero mod two. So let's put a 1 in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th place, and say that that better be equal to 0, mod 2. Next, let's look at the yellow circle. That's this one here. This says that x1 plus x3 plus x4 plus x6 better be equal to 0, mod 2. So 1, 3, 4, 6 better be equal to 0, mod 2. And lastly, let's look at the red circle this one here, this says that x1 plus x2 plus x4 plus c7 should be 0 mod 2. 1, 2, 4, 7. It's going to be equal to 0 mod 2. And again, where I haven't written a 1 in this matrix, I mean for there to be a 0. Okay, let's call this matrix H. So what we've just seen is that any code word C in C satisfies the equation H times C is equal to 0. Another way to say that is that C is contained in the kernel of this matrix H, mod 2. Let me add mod 2 up here. And in fact, I claim that actually C is equal to the kernel of H. We can see this, again, assuming that linear algebra works, by counting dimensions. That is, the dimension of the kernel of H is equal to 7 minus 3, that's because the dimension of the kernel of this matrix is equal to 7 minus the rank of the matrix, and I claim that this matrix has rank 3, and that's because all of the rows are linearly independent. 
Again, you can see this because there's a little identity matrix sitting right there. So that means that the dimension of the kernel of this matrix is 7 minus 3, also known as 4. On the other hand, the dimension of the code C, we saw in the previous slide, was also equal to 4. So now I have that C is contained in the kernel of H, but they both have the same dimension, so they better be equal. So let's erase this containment and write equals. C is equal to the kernel of H. A matrix H like this is called the parity check matrix for a code. Again, I'll define parity check matrix formally in a later video, but informally a parity check matrix is just a matrix so that the code is equal to the kernel of that matrix. It turns out that this parity check matrix view, that is viewing C as the kernel of some matrix, can be really useful. Let's see a couple of examples. The first example is that using this view of C, we'll be able to see really easily that this code C has distance three. This is something we asserted in an earlier video, and perhaps you stared at those circles for a little while and convinced yourself that it was true, but now we can prove it formally pretty easily. First, we saw from our linear algebraic observations earlier that it suffices to show that the minimum weight of C is three. That is, that there is no code word in C with weight less than three. To see that this is true, suppose towards a contradiction that there's some code word C in C that has weight one or two. Then the picture with this parity check matrix looks like this. That is, there is some kernel vector C which has weight one or two of h. So when I multiply h times this vector c, I'm going to get the all zeros vector. But that means that there is some non-zero linear combination of one or two of these columns that's equal to zero. And since any pair of the columns of h are linearly independent, that means that this can't happen. So when I say that any pair of columns are linearly independent, that means first that no column is zero, that's certainly true, and also that I can't take any pair of these columns, say this one and this one, and take some non-trivial linear combination and get zero. Mod two, that can only happen if two columns are the same, and they're not. Great, so that implies that for all C in my code C, the weight of C is at least three. And this implies that the distance of C of the code C is also at least three. To see that the distance is at most three, just consider the code word zero one zero one zero one zero and observe that this has weight three. So that means the distance of the code C is less than or equal to three as well. And combining these two things, we see that C has distance exactly three. Okay, so that's one benefit of this parity check matrix view of a code C, at least for this code. We can read off the distance pretty easily. Here's another example of a benefit. This actually gives us a really slick decoding algorithm. Let's recall this puzzle that we had in an earlier video. So I told you that C twiddle was equal to the corrupted code word 0111010. And I asked you to decode this. So I asked you to find some C in my code C, such that the hamming distance between C and C twiddle is at most one. And you did this either by staring, or we saw sort of how to do it by looking at those circles. But here's one way to do it, looking at this parity check matrix. So on the one hand, we can compute h times c twiddle. Here I've just copied and pasted h over, and here's c twiddle. And we can compute this, and it turns out to be one, one, zero. On the other hand, Let's consider what h times c twiddle actually is. So we have c twiddle is equal to c plus z, where c is our original code word, 
and z is the error that got added. Here, whenever I write plus, I mean plus mod 2. So z here is some weight 1 error vector. And this is all mod 2. But that means that h times c twiddle is equal to h times c plus z is equal to h times c plus h times z. And that's just equal to h times z. Again, mod 2. And the reason is that h times c is 0, because c is in my code, and my code is the kernel of h. So together, this tells me that h times z is equal to h times c twiddle, which we just computed was equal to 1, 1, 0, mod 2. But if z has weight 1, what does it mean for h times z to be equal to something? Basically, that means that z is just picking out one of the columns of h, and that's what comes out. So if we look at which column of h this happens to be, well, it's this one, the third one. So this implies that z has to be the vector 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, which implies that our correct code word, c, is equal to c twiddle plus z, which is equal to c twiddle, except we flip the, uh, the third bit. Again here, plus means plus mod 2. And so that's going to be 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, which is exactly the same thing we got before. So this gives us a really quick decoding algorithm for c. We just compute h times c twiddle, and then we see what column of h is that. OK, so what's the moral of the story? First, we saw that the Hamming code, c, of length 7, is a linear subspace of 0, 1 to the 7. And that meant that we could look at c in two different ways. First, we could write c as the set g times x for x in 0, 1 to the 4. Again, all arithmetic mod 2, which is the column span of G for some matrix G, which we called a generator matrix. We saw that we could write C as the set of vectors C in 0, 1 to the 7, such that H times C is equal to 0, again mod 2, which is the kernel of H, mod 2 for some appropriate matrix that we called a parity check matrix. And finally, we saw that this linear algebraic view was super useful. In particular, it gave us an easy way to compute the distance of C, and also gave us an easy way to decode a corrupted code word from one error. However, all of this was sort of predicated on the assumption that, quote, linear algebra works over 0, 1, mod 2. For example, when we said that c was the kernel of h, mod 2, we relied on this dimension counting argument, which is implicitly relying on the fact that dimension makes any sort of sense, mod 2. Before you move on to the next video, it might be a good idea to stop and first check where we used the fact that linear algebra quote-unquote works, and also to reflect on whether or not it does work.